you've given me an opportunity to talk about something with you that I have spent the last, gosh, should I say 30 plus years um, as a uh, child psychologist and as an academic in both my research and my teaching, I have always focused on children's mental health. And in coming to Western, there was wonderful opportunities to take under wing a number of other initiatives, and uh, I'm gonna share some of those with you tonight. The, the, uh, the bulk of this particular presentation is really talking about the need for systemic change to our mental health system, or lack thereof, within Canada. Uh, these children have been rightly called the orphans, orphan of the health care system in large part because their needs are significantly ignored in our society. And I'll present some statistics to you a little bit later that shows you how significant the problem actually is. But let's start off, first of all, talking about what mental health is. What does it mean to say that we are experiencing positive mental health? Well, mental health is a foundation for children to thrive and to flourish. And I'm going to talk a lot about thriving and flourishing in our faculty since, uh, since I have come. We've talked a lot about our fundamental mission being to ensure that every child in this country has the opportunity to thrive and flourish. And it really means the same thing as mental health because it's a state of well-being, feeling good about yourself, feeling very positive, positive about your potential, your ability to cope in positive ways with normal stresses of life, and certainly as we approach adulthood or as we approach learning tasks, to work productively and fruitfully, and ultimately to make your contribution to, the, to your community. That's what a thriving person does. That's what a person that flourishes does. And we want to ensure that every single child in this country has the opportunity to develop those particular competencies. But you take one look at this particular diagram and you'll see that many children in our country don't feel that. So if we look here at Canadian-born non-Aboriginal children, about 77% of youth and young adults say, yeah, you know what, I feel pretty good about myself. I'm feeling some sense of mental well-being. Now I want you to look at our Canadian-born Aboriginal children, and we see a significant difference. A significant difference. Only 66 to 71 percent feel the same thing. Now when you think about the total number of children in this country, that both of those statistics suggest that over 25 percent don't feel that way about themselves. And this is self-perception. Immigrant children surprisingly do better, but I think we'd see a gradient that changes as a function of whether or not they're living in poverty, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And what is a mental health disorder? Well, there's lots of different ways we look at mental health disorders. I noticed today that a new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, Volume 5, is coming out. What is that huge thing? Well, it is a diagnostic system that we as psychologists or psychiatrists use to diagnose particular uh, conditions. But if we used an overarching description, we would say that it is an emotional or cognitive pattern of functioning that's associated with a lot of distress, a lot of suffering, or impairment in one or more areas of one's life, in school, in work, in social or in family interactions. Mental health disorders can occur at any age. You can see mental health disorders in very, very young children, and we obviously see them right across the lifespan into, elder, into our elderly population. Each type of disorder that we talk about has its own specific pattern. It differentiates itself from another one. And children present with different severity levels. So we can see autism spectrum disorders in children ranging all the way from birth right through to the end of life and expressing themselves with very different severity. So you can have very mild autism or you can have very severe autism. And we see that with all of the conditions. 
Some people experience a sudden onset of symptoms. That is, it comes relatively unannounced. And in other people, we see a gradual deterioration. I wanted to show you uh, what we would see in children. And these are prevalent statistics from Canada. And they show the most common disorders experienced by children. And obviously, the most common are anxiety disorders. I trust we all know what anxiety disorders are. They're, they're worrying, constant worrying and fretfulness. We talk about there being a cognitive bias such that they are constantly questioning what will happen if, what will happen if. And uh, about 6.4% of children have diagnosed Diagnosable, I can't get the word out. <laughs> Diagnosed condition. And by that I mean to say they have met all of, the severity, uh, all of the severity criteria to diagnose them with a disorder. This doesn't begin to account for all of the other children who express mild to medium levels of severity of this condition. So this is just kids who require very intensive kind of treatment. The second most common condition in this country is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, a condition I've studied for the last 30 years. And this is one that a lot of people question, does it even exist? Well, we have pretty significant neuropsychological and neuroscience evidence to suggest that yes, this is a neurobehavioral disorder. It starts in the brain and it changes the way that children control their inhibitions. And so it presents itself in almost 5% of children in a very severe kind of form. Conduct disorder, rule violation, these are the kids that test society, society to its limit. These are the youngsters who don't believe the rules apply to them. These are the youngsters who often end up in juvenile detention centers, 4.2% of our population. Any depressive disorder, the kids that feel hopeless, that feel unwanted, that feel unloved, despite sometimes having all of the affirmatory evidence that they can, but they have a cognitive bias that doesn't let them see that. Again, pretty strong genetic foundation to it. Substance abuse, now they start to fall off. Substance abuse, about 1%. Autism spectrum disorders, 0.3%. Three out of every hundred, or three out of every thousand, sorry. Obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which is a kind of anxiety disorder that causes children to have either obsessions or compulsions or both, where they have certain thoughts and then they have to engage in certain kind of behavior to eradicate the anxiety that surrounds that. Any eating disorder. Schizophrenia, very uncommon, and bipolar disorder only recently have we recognized that that particular condition actually exists in children. Um, usually I start off by telling a story of why I'm, I'm in the area that I am in and why I feel as passionately about children's mental health as I do. And, and I just want to take a, a slight turn and, and tell you about uh, the boy, the young man, who inspired me to really take on a bigger cause. And his name was James. And at the time I was a faculty member at the University of Saskatchewan. And I had the privilege of starting a clinic at the time, um, a large interdisciplinary clinic in which we provided training for our students, our graduate students. And this young man came in one day because he wanted to go back to school. He was about 18 years old at the time. And he wanted to go back to school, and he was very unkept, very unkept. I shall always remember James' shoes, because they were a pair of runners that flapped when he walked. The, the bottom sole had come loose. And uh, he was sent in to see one of our students, who began working with him to explore how best we could support him in returning to school. And we discovered very quickly that James had a long history of psychiatric and psychological problems, starting back when he was a very young boy. 
In talking to his mother, she would remind us that, you know, when James was six, seven years old, he was a very avoidant child. He didn't like to be around other kids. He liked to be by himself. And he was often very inward and afraid of engaging in certain kinds of things. He didn't like heights. He didn't like loud noises. He didn't like particular smells. And um, this became increasingly more debilitating for him as time went on. As with most provinces at the time, and Ontario continues uh, to experience, James went from one place to another seeking assistance. They went to the children's hospital, they went to psychiatric centers, they went to psychological services, they went to social workers, they went to another social worker, they went to another psychologist. And this would repeat itself over and over and over again. And while James would get discreet treatment in one of those, each one of those places, communication between the places was lacking, what we call continuity of care. And when James came to our place, he had a psychiatrist who was giving him medication because he had been diagnosed then with schizophrenia. He was working with a social worker who was trying to help him establish independent living skills within his home. He was working with another social worker who was trying to integrate him into a workplace environment. He was working with another psychologist who was giving him some therapeutic kind of treatment. And the list went on, but nobody spoke. And then he came to our place. And while I didn't treat James, he just became a good buddy. He became a good friend. He'd always sit and talk with me and we'd chat. And um, one day he phoned me up early in the morning and he said to me, <clears throat> Vicki, I always used to tease him about his shoes. And he said, Vicki, today I'm going to go downtown with my mom. This is in Saskatoon. I'm going to go downtown with my mom. I'm going to get new shoes. I'm going to get new shoes. Wow, awesome, James. And then I'm going to go up to this education place in this particular building, and I'm going to see if I can get some funding to return to this program. And I said, that's awesome, James. Good on you. Two hours later, I got a phone call from his mother, who had taken him to lunch, that James had taken the elevator up to the 13th floor and jumped off with his new shoes. And I thought that day my world ended because what did I miss? What didn't I hear that I might have heard? Why didn't we speak more to each other as professionals? And those very same conditions exist to this day. If we think our children are safe, they are not. And so we really need to talk today about systemic changes that ensure that every child has that opportunity to thrive and flourish. So here are some of the kinds of things that you might see in a child that could alert you to some potential problems. This is certainly not exhaustive, but we may see changes in interactions with friends and family, mood swings, emotional outbursts, a lot of anger, difficulty eating and sleeping, dealing with authority, risk-taking behavior, not the things that he or she used to enjoy. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to McDonald's. Damaging other people's property, worrying constantly, obsessed with his or her weight, lacking energy or motivation, aggressive to himself or herself and to others. All very common. And one of the things that I should say to you is that it's pretty developmental as well. Kids tend to go through some stages at particular ages, and it's normal. For example, Night terrors are pretty normal in children four and five years old. We don't need to get particularly preoccupied with them. But if a child is 11 or 12 and experiencing them, then it may indicate the need for more significant um, examination. Mental health in kids is pretty common. You know, we talk a lot about stigma reduction. It's very important because it's not an uncommon thing. And it can be transitory. It can last for a short period of time, or it can be debilitating and last throughout life, but it is very common. We know in this country today, anywhere from 13 to 25% of children at one time or another will have a diagnosable condition. That's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids. 
Interestingly, 70% of adults with a mental illness indicate that it started before they were 18 years of age, 50% before age 14. So what does that say to you? If we engaged in active health promotion and prevention, the long-term effects don't have to be there. We're just not doing things quick enough. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in ages 16 to 24. You hear it all the time, don't you? You hear it all the time. And often it's associated with what I would consider to be behavior that's compromised in a bully. You know, we see a lot of uh, um, bullying leading to really poor outcomes. We also know that if one mental health disorder is present, the likelihood that there will be more than one is almost 45%. So in other words, if a child presents with depression, it's pretty likely they'll also have anxiety problems. If a child presents with ADHD, often it is the case that they'll also have oppositional problems. You know, they'll be negative and difficult to deal with. Those things just sit together. I thought this was kind of interesting. Quality adjusted life scores for persons with selected health status. And so the longer the line is, the longer you'll live. So if we look at asthma, okay, it's a little longer, isn't it? Diabetes, not too bad. Heart disease, not too bad. Now look what happens. We see a dramatic drop in lifespan as a function of mental health status. Mental health status. Okay, so that tells you the mind and the body are integrally related. Integrally related. Mental health can cause death, often just by virtue of the fact that the lack of care that the person gives to himself or herself. Let's talk about risk factors. Why do some kids develop mental health problems and others don't? Well, biological factors, you know, I, I have an anxious personality. I, I don't have an anxiety disorder, but I have an anxious personality. And you know what? I raised an anxious kid. He's just like his mother. He does everything like his mother. We worry about everything. We're perfectionists. And so I would argue probably a good portion of that is genetic because both of us came out of the womb from what I, from what I experienced with my son and from what my mother told me about myself, I came out of the womb telling everyone what to do. I was difficult and my son was the same way. So we know that there are many conditions that there is a biological basis to. ADHD, strong genetic factor. Schizophrenia, even stronger. Bipolar disorder, yes. Depression, yes. Anxiety, yes. So there is something, but just because a child has a biological or genetic predisposition does not mean that they will necessarily develop that condition. Not, you, not, not always. A, a disorder like autism, um, it is less, less easy to control the expression of that, but anxiety and things like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Environment is indeed the catalyst for the expression of those biological factors. In other words, I may come out with the genes that say, I have a propensity to develop anxiety, but if I grow up in a very stable kind of family home, if indeed I develop good coping skills, if indeed I have good intellectual abilities, if indeed, if indeed, if indeed, I will likely never develop a disorder. If there is an absence of those things, then it likely will have a greater uh, propensity to demonstrate itself. The most important thing, and you're going to hear me going back and back and back and back, are prevention programs. Because we can help at a very early stage to build what, what is called assets or competence or strengths in kids to ensure that they can protect themselves. We can also help families to do those sorts of things. But let's take a look at where we are in this country today. And this to me is unacceptable unacceptable, it is untenable. We know that mental health disorders affect like 15 to 20 percent of kids. It is the single most common health problem experiencing children in this country today. But 
No, not but yet. Nearly a, a million young Canadian children present with, and this should actually say, a diagnosable condition, a severe condition. One million children are walking around this country today with a serious mental health problem. 70%, as I mentioned before, it starts at that time. And it varies across ages. So young people ages 15 to 24 are more likely to exhibit these disorders than other kids. We also know that poverty is one of the strongest predictors of mental health problems in kids. And that, that really has to do with the fact that there are so many environmental stresses associated with poverty. It doesn't speak to the quality of parenthood or anything else. It speaks to all of the issues that are compounded in those particular situations. And we also know that Aboriginal immigrant and homeless youth are represented amongst those who experience mental health problems. Again, it probably links more to poverty than to any other factor. I'm going to jump ahead because, you know, I always have 8,000 um, overheads and never enough time to present them all. But uh, <clears throat> what I really wanted to talk about is the scary part of all of this. Here's this million children in this country. A million children. And you know what? Less than 75%, less than 80%. Some statistics say uh, that only 5%, 3%, 2% of the million kids actually ever get professional care. Now, we had Senator Michael Kirby, who heads the Mental Health Commission for Canada here at a forum a little while ago, and he used this analogy, and it really, really hit home. You know what? If we only offered treatment to one out of every five people who experiences stroke, what would happen in our society? There would be a public outcry. We would be screaming, this is untenable. What would we do if we only treated one in every five broken legs and left the rest to stumble? What would we do in this country? And yet we sit day after day and only one out of every five of these children ever gets the kind and nature of treatment that he or she needs. Not good enough for me. It's not good enough for me. Most of these children, the only place they ever get any kind of support is within the school. The school has been called the de facto mental health center, but you know what? It is not. It is not in a position to offer the kind and nature of support that children require in the absence of very substantial systemic changes. It can't. Teachers are not, um, are simply not trained to do this. And we know that by virtue of the fact that if these children today don't get treatment, the long-term outcome for them will not be good. They create enormous distress and cost for families. It's very difficult. I remember a mother I worked with, Uda was her name, and she had a young son. Well, he wasn't young anymore. He was 17 or 18 uh, with uh, pretty significant autism. And she came into our clinic one day, and I said, Uda, you look so tired. Tired, Vicky, she said. I have not slept a night through in 17 years. 17 years. That's the drain. That's the pain. That's the amount of work that we put on some of these families in trying their very damnedest to support these children. Not good enough. If we don't prevent or treat these conditions early in life, they often persist into adulthood. And now we begin to see that there's going to be huge economic costs to our society by way of employment, by way of health care, by way of the justice system, and the list goes on and on. So, what do we do? Um, I put in here just a quick slide to let you show the, 
the situation in Ontario, you know what it costs uh, for treatment, one child about 73, I, I find this very distressing incidentally, $7,300 a year. 54% of that didn't even get spent on the child, directed towards administrative costs. We're missing the boat somewhere. We're missing the boat some way. And a study by Pepler and others showed that case managing, management numerous hands-off and waiting periods resulted in 71% of all the activities. And they were considered to be non-value added. It did nothing for the kids. So we're not even using what we have in a particularly positive way. Do any of you, if any of you in the room tried to access the mental health system for children? Was it easy? No, I know, I know, it is anything but. The, the problems pervasive in the child mental health system, and actually um, a researcher by the name of Dr. Stan Kutcher from Dalhousie is a Canada research chair in mental health, says we don't have a system, don't delude yourself. This isn't a system, this is a non-system because it is so fragmented. But these are some of the, the challenges uh, that those of you put your hand up will probably have experienced. Lack of timely service. You can be on a waiting list a year, 16 months, two years. Do you know what happens to a child and a family in two years? Not good enough. Lack of uh, accessible care. By accessible care, it should be something you can tap very easily. You don't have to get in a car and drive for four hours to get the service you need. That's not accessible. We believe, I believe, it needs to be available in the community in which you live, work, and play. And I'm talking about your neighborhood community, not one in the whole city of London. That's not accessible. That's not accessible for a parent who is living in poverty particularly, who doesn't have a car, who doesn't have the economic resources to be able to access that. No. Appropriate services, that means something very special to me. It means evidence-based. It means that we know from research this is a service and a treatment plan that has shown itself to be effective. Um, our mental health system should never operate on beliefs. That's unfair. That's unfair to you. We have a duty to care, which means we offer what we know works. We have financial barriers to accessing services. I, I, I referenced that when I just talked about those people who live in geographically rural areas or who don't have a car or who don't have the money to be able to take the bus, who can't hire a babysitter. Fragmentation of services. You need to go here to get this. You need to go there to get this. If you have a ch anybody here have a child with autism? Th these parents are amazing being able to, the, the ropes and the things that they have to work around. Because you can be asked to go this place to get that kind of service and then you're going to go somewhere else to get ABA and then you're going to go somewhere else to get medication. And that's fragmentation. You need one-stop shopping. You need to be able to go to one place and very smoothly work through all of the things that your child needs, ensuring all the time that the people working with you are A, listening to you, taking your advice, taking your needs in mind, and importantly, talking to each other. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this because time will run away on us very, very quickly. Um, but the next one really says something that I think is really important. Lack of parental involvement and decision making. This is your child. This is your child. And you are the expert on your child. You need to be as involved in the decision-making process as you possibly can be. And that means giving you education so that you understand the condition, giving you choices, and giving you the support that you need to make what are sometimes very difficult decisions. So we look at all of this and say, you know what, enough. Enough. The time is now, we really need to change what doesn't work. 
We've been on a very long mission in our faculty. Well, not long. I've only been here a little more than a year, but it seems long because we're out on the road a fair bit talking about this in lots of different places. And I'm kind of going to put my notes aside and just talk to you for a few minutes. Um, as I've moved across the country, I've seen all kinds of mental health systems for kids uh, moving from the west to the east. And every province does some things very well and does some things not so very well. And uh, one of the things that I've observed in, in uh, London and in Ontario is a huge plethora of agencies. Huge! I think, I forget somebody told me 255 or something in, in uh, London alone. And I think, oh man, if I was a parent and I suddenly became concerned that my child had something going on, how would I navigate that system? Where do I go? And so one day I just played around on the, with the phone book and the, the, the internet and I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and figure out where I would go if I had this situation. And I'm telling you that I couldn't. I couldn't. And uh, so, you know, the, the provincial government has recently come out with a document that proclaims it is on the move now to change in a positive way the mental health system for children. And I'm very heartened by it. Um, they talk about building the technology that will allow them to follow a child from place to place to place that will ensure better communication. They talk about putting more people out in the field. Now, I don't believe that putting more people out in the field or more money in the field per se does anything. Um, I'm going to talk later about where I think it needs to go. Uh, they are talking about amalgamating agencies, what they call lead agencies. And, um, you know, we'll watch with great anticipation to see what does happen. But at the same time, we in the university feel, you know, we'd like to do something a little more proactive today. Today. So, what we want to do is build what we call research and demonstration sites. Let's face it, the university's job is to research and to educate. Those are our mandate. We're not service agencies in the sense of providing mental health services to kids. We are researchers and we are educators. And we feel that what we would like to do is create a demonstration site in a community, a community that's highly, highly vulnerable, and a byproduct of that will, of course, be providing service. We would like to work with our university and with numerous agencies in our community to bring what we call a system of care to that particular community. Now, we have spent a lot of time looking at the research literature and saying, what would be, if we went all over the world and we looked at every place that we could possibly look, to see where children's mental health is best served, what would be the ideas that would come to the table? So let me talk to you about some of the ideas that came to our table as we did that search. We started off looking in different countries. And Canada is way behind in many, many respects. We do some things really well and some things not so well. Uh, Roy Romaner called the mental health of children the orphan's orphan of the healthcare system, we do it that poorly. But if we went to a place like New Zealand, we would see these radically different and innovative kinds of solutions. Now, they're just exploring and they're just wading waters, but their theory of how they're going to move forward is incredibly innovative and involves systems of care, location of services to communities, uh, public health policies, all of those things. I'll talk about them more in a minute. Um, England does some things pretty good, some things not so good in the children's mental health system. But one of the things they have done really well is create what are called public health trusts, which means that they take the money right out to the neighborhood in which kids live. And they provide the services in that place. So kids don't have to get on a bus. Parents don't have to move across the city. The services that he or she needs are right there in their community. The United States has done, now they have a real mess, for different reasons again, financial crisis, but they have been the world leader in innovative kinds of solutions. They haven't had a lot of success necessarily in implementing them. 
But three that we really want to bring to the table here are the notion of systems of care or interconnected systems, public health policy toward children's mental health, and thirdly, resilience or competence-based approaches. So where you would like to build this research and demonstration site and bring some really innovative ideas into it, really innovative ideas into it, and our school boards and a huge number of community agencies have said to us, we want to be part of that. So a systems of care is based on the very notion that it takes a village to grow healthy kids. And we want to create that village in every community attached to schools around the places where children live and play. Now, we can't do that. We're only going to produce the research that says this works or this doesn't work or whatever. But we hope that people from all over the country will come and learn from what we are presenting. They will learn that they too can take this kind of care back to their neighborhood. So a community of care operates on various principles. It operates on the principle that whatever we do for children, it must be driven by the needs of children and families first. Not agencies, not agencies, not what agencies think a community needs, but rather what families and children say their needs are. That needs to be first. Secondly, parents need to be critical decision makers in the care of their children. They need to be consulted and listened to as experts on their child. And thirdly, these services need to be accessible without you having to drive anywhere. They need to be in your community. And then we add some other various elements to that. They need to be, and I'm going to call it transdisciplinary. You've all heard the word interdisciplinary, but I don't buy that anymore. Interdisciplinary is where professionals like physicians and psychologists and social workers and, and teachers and so work together. But we really think they need to learn new ways of working together. New ways that recognize, first of all, they all have expertise and need to be respected for that. But importantly, they understand the critical role of the parent and the family in decision making. Um, these systems also need to be culturally sensitive. You can't go running into a particular community where you have a high immigrant population and start dictating the way things should be. You need to have a high degree of sensitivity to the needs culturally of that particular community. I can keep going down the list. There are lots of very specific aspects around systems of care. One uh, most important is what you do, again, just to reinforce a point made earlier, must be based on evidence. Just because I believe that you know, I can pull you out of poverty by mentoring you for the next six months doesn't mean that it works. Six months down the road, I can leave and you'll be in exactly the same place that you are. You may have felt pretty good having me visit you once a week. Probably not, but, um, <laughs> but we have to do what evidence says works. How many of you would take cancer treatment if it didn't have all the studies that show that it works? Would you? I, I, I doubt it. I doubt it very much. And yet we ask kids to do that every day to treat their mental health just because we think it works. So we, we're going to base part of this on this wonderful notion of a village where all the services are brought to a particular community that children and families can access in a non-stigmatizing way. They don't have to travel across the city. There's no fragmentation of services. Everybody is there. Everybody is there. And the second uh, theoretical framework that we want to bring to this is public health policy and promotion. And that does two things. Public health policy says, you don't wait till people are dying before you start trying to figure out how you support them. That's not smart. What you do is, first of all, try to figure out what causes cancer? What causes migraines? And then what do you do? You get at that very thing that initiates the whole cycle. So we could go back to risk factors, environmental factors, for example. We know that poverty is a significant factor and a significant predictor in mental health problems. We know that marital discourse 
is a significant factor in mental health problems in kids. And we can go down the list. There's lots of things we know. Well, treating the child doesn't change the fact that mom and dad are having some real marital difficulties, does it? Because that child will go home and experience the same thing that night and the problems become worse. I remember many, many years ago, I was a young psychologist at the time. You think, oh, I could just do everything now. And I had a, a group of um, kindergarten kids who had all been referred um, for a special classroom because of aggression. And I thought, you know, I'm going to do an anger management group with them. We're going to teach them how to ma ma manage their anger. And uh, there are lots of anger management programs and lots of groups do that right now. But you know what? It doesn't work in isolation. I didn't know that. So I had these darling little kids come and we learned how to deep breathe and how to relax and how to reframe and all of these sorts of things. And they would come back the next class and I'd say, and how did it go? And oh, great, you know, you only knocked one kid out and da da da. And uh, one day they came back and I said the same thing. How did it go this week? Did you do your deep breathing? And this little guy looked at me and he said, Oh, Vicki, I breathed and I breathed and I breathed and Daddy just kept hitting Mommy over and over. But I breathed and I breathed and I breathed. And I thought, what the heck am I doing? What am I doing? And that really speaks to the need to get at the social determinants of problems. We need to support that family if we want that little boy to be well. And so we really feel the fundamental importance of bringing to our community a health promotion and health prevention. And it involves every bit of that community. Families, the community itself, the way kids relate to one another, the schools in which kids go. So that's the second aspect of, of this demonstration site. And the third is a hopeful part, a very hopeful part, because kids have a natural tendency to make things right. They can do OK despite significant adversity in their lives. And that's what's called resilience. And we can teach children how to be resilient through coping skills, through developing those natural abilities of theirs to cope with things when they get really different, difficult. A child, you know, I, I've done ADHD research throughout my life. And, um, you know, we did a large study of adults who were diagnosed with ADHD. And some of them have had, li had lifelong struggles. They really did. Their, their lives were anything but pleasant. But one was a neurosurgeon. I, I always thought, I, I, I don't think that's where I'd go for my surgery, but anyway. <laughs> or or the, the, for the, to the dentist. Um, that's my own neurosis. Um, but, but many are very, very successful. Many pilots, incidentally, uh, have some form of ADHD because of the reaction time. They have incredible reaction time. Incredible reaction time. ADHD kids have amazing talents. I grew to absolutely adore working with both adults with ADHD and certainly children with ADHD. And, you know, they can do so well if we build on their assets. Many of them are so bright and so vigilant and good humor and all of those sorts of things. They can be taught to develop outstanding coping skills and do exceptionally well. And so resiliency literature says we can identify all kinds of what are called moderators and mitigators, things that soften the effects of adversity. Because when you have a mental health problem or you have a disability, that's a natural adversity. Every day you're struggling with something. And so we need to find those protective factors that can soften the effects of that adversity. And again, research gives us lots of indications of what those might be. Or we need to develop 
uh, mitigate, uh, moderating factors that can actually change the path. And I've talked a little bit about that before by working with families, for example. So our demonstration sites, our research and demonstration sites want to take some of these really innovative ideas. And we want to bring them to the London community in two sites located in and around schools in a high poverty, very vulnerable neighborhood. And we want to implement some of these innovative ideas and re research them and see if they work. Because if they do work, we want to be able to tell the rest of this city, the rest of this country, and the rest of this world how we can better meet the needs of these youngsters. If they don't work, we also want to tell everyone in the London community, in this Canadian country, and across the rest of the world, this doesn't work. You have a duty of care to move on to something else that will support this child in a positive way. We want to be able to demonstrate through research how best to support families children in families, extended families, community members, to grow, kill, nurture children who are thriving, who are flourishing, and who are happy. So I invite your questions. I would love to dialogue with you about any aspect that we've talked. 